Tanji, the university librarian. There we go. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming to our spring exhibit, Costuming Leading Ladies of Shakespeare from Stratford to Orange County. As the title mentions, this exhibit examines the evolution of stage costuming for women in Shakespearean plays. And it touches upon two Orange County connections. One is Helena Majeska, who, as many of you know, is the leading Shakespearean actress from the late 19th to the early 20th century. And she lived in this area for a time. And UCI drama productions from the early days up into the recent New Swan Theater Productions. And so before we get started, I have a number of acknowledgments to make. Uh, first, we highly value our partnership with the Claire Trevor School of the Arts, the drama department. Yes. And the UCI School of Humanities as well. And we're also very honored to feature in the exhibit highlights from the collection of the late Clayton Garrison, founding dean of what was then called the School of Fine Arts. Now, we're also extremely grateful for our collaborations with the UCI Shakespeare Center and the New Swan Shakespeare Festival. And we have had the pleasure of hosting First Folio Fridays in conjunction with the New Swan Theater in August. And at these events, we offer the chance for visitors to see Shakespeare's first folio. And there are only about 235 copies that still exist. And we have one of them here at UCI. Now, this was gifted to us by Patrick Hanratty, and he was a UCI alumnus and also the inventor of CAD CAM. And if you want to hear the rest of the story, you're going to have to come to our first folio events in <laughs> August, OK? Now, this annual event would not be possible without the passion and dedication of UCI Shakespeare Center co-directors, Professors Julia Lupton and Professor Eli Simon, if they would stand. <laughs> And I'd like to acknowledge a few other special guests who are here tonight, um, or at least I hope they're here tonight. Uh, we are lucky to have in our special collections and archives the papers of Professor Robert Cohen. Yes, yes. And he is the founding chair of the UCI Drama Department and Emeritus Professor in Drama. He is a noted author, actor, director, producer, playwright, drama critic, administrator, educator, and mentor to many. And his papers include his world famous textbooks on acting, manuscripts, research articles, as well as over 50 production books, one of which is featured in the exhibit. And of course, um, his major supporter is his wife, Lorna, and so I'm not sure if they're here, but if they are, it would be my pleasure to acknowledge both of them. If they're not, let's just clap them in the <laughs> Now, as many of you know, um, we are in the Jack Langston Library, the main library at UCI. It serves as the major information resource for the campus and the surrounding Orange County community. Uh, on the slide, you can see that we recently opened a new collaboration zone on the third floor of the building, and I invite you to visit it during the reception. Um, we created this with the support of two important UCI trustees, Jack and Shanaz Langson. Please join me in thanking them, and Shanaz is right there. Okay, and we are also honored to have as a special guest, Mrs. Dolores Grenigan. UCI's Forrest J. Grenigan Medical Library is named after her husband. And Mrs. Grenigan has been a strong supporter of the library's spaces and services that support 
the health sciences users and the community. And so we recently renovated, you can see in the, in the slide, and named a study room in the Grenigan Medical Library due to her support. So please join me in thanking Mrs. Grenigan, who's right over there. Okay, and next, I would like to acknowledge the exhibit co-curators. I'll start first with Scott Stone. He is the research librarian for performing arts. He holds a master's in music performance and master's in library science from the University of North Texas, as well as two bachelors of music from the University of Georgia. He is extremely active with the Music Library Association at both the national and the state level. And his publications can be found in many journals, such as Reference Music Services Quarterly, MLA's Notes, uh, Reference and User Services Quarterlies, and stay tuned for his first book called Outreach for Music Librarians, which should be published in December 2018 by AR Editions. And he says, when you say hi, make sure to ask who he's wearing. So please stand up and let's thank Scott. And next, our second co-curator is Joshua Hutchinson. He is the cataloging and metadata librarian, as well as the interim film librarian. Now, Joshua gained extensive experience cataloging French publications and other materials in all formats in his position at the Cambridge University Libraries from 2010 to 2016. Now, Joshua has dual <laughs> Joshua has dual American and British citizenship, and he graduated with a BA in history at Skidmore College in New York. He received his MA in medieval history from the University of Durham in the UK, and his MSc Econ in library and information studies from the University of Wales, Aberystwyth. So please join me in thanking Joshua. Next, I'd like to acknowledge the many library staff members and students who made this event possible. Thank you all. And to begin our exciting program, I would like to introduce Marcy Froelich, who is the assistant professor of costume design. Now, Professor Froelich started her career in New York as the associate costume designer on touring productions of Broadway's The Phantom of the opera. And, <laughs> and as the designer for such shows as Dames at Sea and Madama Butterfly. She gained great international experience working in Rome, Tokyo, and Rotterdam as the assistant designer and costume coordinator for Robert Wilson's multinational opera, the Civil Wars. Marcy is also Emmy nominated, and her film and television credits include Miss America Pageant, We Shall Remain, American Beauty, Road to Perdition, and For Your Consideration, just to name a few. <laughs> she has an MFA from University of Michigan and has taught costume design at UCLA, Santa Barbara City College, State University of New York and New Paltz, and of course, UCI. And in her spare time, she, <laughs> yes, where, where do you have spare time? She is a painter and a photographer, and her artwork has been exhibited in LA at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. And on top of all of that, she is a member of the Television Academy. So join me in welcoming that. <laughs> One thing that's very fun about the credits is that We Shall Remain, which was a production done by PBS. It was uh, a PBS documentary about the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Uh, her sister, Lydia, and I worked together. Lydia Tanji is a costume designer in the Bay Area. And when I first moved here, when I first got to UCI, Lydia said, you know, my sister's there. Maybe you should, should meet. So it was really quite a wonderful thing. 
So uh, let me get my notes here, and then I will start. Uh, one thing that it, I was talking to Lorelai about, it, it seems like the stars aligned for this uh, talk. Because um, first of all, I love libraries, and I've loved doing research since I was uh, in school, in um, undergraduate school. And there was the school I was at, there was a wonderful abroad program where I went abroad and uh, we saw a number of different plays, but everyone else in the program was an actor. So they went off and took acting lessons. I, as a costume designer, went off to do research all over London, at different libraries and museums, and my topic was the costuming of Shakespeare's plays from his time to the present. <laughs> So when Scott mentioned to me, this is what the exhibit is going to be, I go, I have the paper! <laughs> and here it is, I still have it. And this helped me put the lecture together. <laughs> so I have not only the, right, the written part, 40 pages, as well as I did a lot of, of my own sketches when I went to exhibits and saw the research. But um, one thing about the research that was really great. Uh, oh, that's my talk. <laughs> Next is, um, there were two places in England that I did quite a bit of research at, the Victoria and Albert Museum and Leighton House, which at the time was Theater Museum. And uh, there, Leighton House is an exquisite mansion of uh, uh, Leighton. And at the time, it was the Theater Museum. and. I was doing research there, and I, my favorite memory of all time of doing research in London was sitting there, and around 4 o'clock, they brought in a tray of tea and cookies for me. And it made me feel like I should be there. It gave me confidence. It gave me a sense that I wasn't masquerading as a researcher. I really was a researcher. And it was really exciting. And, and I, I hope that that's, well, except for the tray and cook tray of tea and cookies. I hope that that kind of feeling is what we give to our undergraduate students. Um, also, this talk was helped by this pamphlet called Speaking Through Style. Danielle Nieves uh, was an MFA graduate. She graduated last year, and this was her thesis. She put this together as well as did an exhibit at Majeska House. She's a costume designer. She's now working at Seattle Rep. But, um, Put in, it's a phenomenal book, and she brought together pictures from all across the world and wrote all the details in it. So my little part about Majeska, thank you, Danielle. Uh, and then I also have a book from our library here, which is a, a new book, and it's about uh, King Lear and the Izamu Noguchi uh, production of King Lear. And I'll be showing you some pictures from that. So. So that's. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that um, the person who I think really should be doing this talk is Holly Poe Durbin. Who <laughs> she's looking at, at me shocked. She's the head of the costume design program. And she is the one who teaches Shakespeare in our program. But she is so busy that she couldn't do this talk because she is designing Henry IV right now for the, um, the Shakespeare Center of LA, it opens June 8th, and it stars Tom Hanks as Falstaff. So put that on your calendars. You can go to, you can Google Tom Hanks as, as Falstaff and the Shakespeare Center of LA, and you can put on a, be put on a list for um, when they start to sell tickets, you can get tickets. And I wanted to tell you about Henry IV, because I think this production was perhaps one of the main things that made me want to be a costume designer. When I was in England and I was doing research, we went to Stratford and we saw this production of Henry IV. And as you see on the left, the stage was black and there were leaves on it and most of the play happened that way. And then at the very end of Henry IV, Henry finally becomes king. And he's been cavorting in the bar with all of these peasants, Falstaff being one of them. And at that moment that he becomes king, they take this white sheet and they pull it down the stage and the leaves went flying. And Falstaff and his guys come tumbling onto the stage. And then Henry comes down the middle of the stage and he is wearing this absolutely gold sequined outfit. 
And to me, it was a symbolic break between Henry and Falstaff. Now, I'm not saying every production has to do that, but I was so amazed that I couldn't speak for a few minutes after the show was over because it had made such an impact visually on me and it really conveyed to me the story of what that was about. So I'm going to go back in time and take you first to uh, the Elizabethans, which is when uh, Shakespeare was writing. Uh, the clothing at the time of the nobility was sumptuous. As you can see, bold colors, rich fabrics, embroidery. And Ben Jonson says in Every Man Out of His Humor, through the character of Carlo Buffone, to be an accomplished gentleman, twere good you turned four or five hundred acres of your best land into two or three trunks of apparel. <laughs> and the Duke of Württemberg in 1592 said, many a one does not hesitate to wear velvet in the streets, which is common with them, whilst at home they have not a piece of dry bread. So clothing was very important to them. And uh, so we ask ourselves, where did the clothing come from? Besides the Elizabethan clothing, there was also foreign influence. Uh, on the left, uh, the, the top pieces are from Vecellio's Renaissance costume book. Um, plates that were written or drawn at the time in 1590. The one on the left, Persian military. The two, the one in the middle and to the right, are they're from Florida. That's what, that's what they thought people in Florida looked like. And I'm not sure if it's actually true or if it was fantastical of what they felt Floridians looked like. Down here, is, this is actually a plate from the 1700s. And uh, the writing was all in Old German. So I know that the one on the left is Spanish. And the others, I kind of figure I got it right. Um, but for, you know, to be truthful, I guessed. And, but you can see that people were dressed in a variety of different ways, whereas today over the world there is quite a bit more homogene, homogeneity. I don't think I said that right, but. Um, and Don Pedro in Much Ado About Nothing says, there is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be a fancy that he hath to strange disguises, as to be a Dutchman today, a Frenchman tomorrow, or in the shape of two countries at once, as a German from the waist downward, all slops, and a Spaniard from the hip upward, no doublet. So where did the players get these costumes? Well, costumes were very important, and um, scenery was very minimal, and in order to depict royalty, they pretty much had to outdo their patrons. It is said that the costumes in the Shakespearean theater were probably of more value than the theater building itself. Tailors were employed to take bits and pieces and move costume bits back and forth. They were probably also um, um, built some of the costumes or made some of the costumes. However, a number of the costumes were received, first of all, by servants. If a noble person didn't want their outfit, they might give it to their servant. And the servant couldn't really wear that in the streets, so they sold it to the players or the nobility themselves sold it to the players because they figured, hey, this is, um, you know, we'll get some money and I can buy something else. So what they saw on stage sometimes actually was aristocratic clothing. Also the court revels office sometimes costumed actors who came to court. And keep in mind that at this time women were played by young men or boys. So um, it doesn't happen until the 1600s that we have female actresses. At this time also in Elizabethan time, color symbolism was very important. It was well known, Christian symbolism and in heraldry. Uh, some of it, the ideas came from the source that, it, that the dye itself came from. For instance, violet dye comes from a Mediterranean crustacean and it's very expensive to extract, and therefore purple became the color of royalty because it was hard to get to. Uh, perhaps something from usage. A straw color meant abundance, and if you think about harvested wheat, then that would give you the idea of abundance. But here, um, if you can see the writing, uh, there's a color called carnation. These are all reddish colors. Carnation meant deep, dark red. It was a deep, dark red color. It meant love. Catherine Pear, a russet red, meant betrayal. 
Horseflesh, don't you love that name, <laughs> was a red brown of a bay horse, and it meant gallantry. Now, this, as far as I know, is the only picture that we have of a Shakespearean production. It was drawn by, um, by Henry Peacham, who is a schoolmaster and a pamphleteer. Uh, as you can see, there's some uh, attempt at historical costuming, but it's a mixture. There was some attempt at, at religious or national distinctions, such as Turks or Moors or the Jewish character of Shylock. Uh, there was also some historical costuming. We have evidence of historical costuming in plays like Julius Caesar or Antony and Cleopatra. This is Titus Andronicus, and Henry Peacham drew this. We think that it's uh, what he saw as opposed to him making it up. So, I'll explain. On the left, you have soldiers. They are in Elizabethan dress. The one on the left, however, has a scimitar, which is a Middle Eastern or from autumn of sword from the Ottoman Empire. The one on the right has a Roman helmet and breastplate with his Elizabethan garb. Titus, who is in the middle, is in Roman armor. Tamara, who's queen of the Goths, is dressed as a medieval queen, so she's backdated from the Elizabethan time. Her sons, Chiron and Demetrius, one is Elizabethan and one is Roman. And Aaron, who is a Moor here on the right, he's in Roman armor over what looks to me like an Elizabethan doublet. So there is a mixture, which the audience may have just embraced as fine. Also at this time, towards the um, end of Shakespeare's life, uh, Inigo Jones was responsible for designing masks in court for James I. They were court masks, they were imaginatory, um, I'm sorry, imaginative, uh, allegorical, with quite a bit of visual splendor. And I think this is where perhaps the separation or the challenge becomes of how do you balance the words to the spectacle. And it's something that you will see throughout the history of costuming, or I would even say stage design, of how do you uh, have Shakespeare's words sing out and not be overpowered by the spectacle? How do you have the spectacle um, or the vision support the words? So, uh, in 1642, the theaters closed in England. Now, a lot of this talk I'm giving is about England and a little bit of, about America. Um, and that's because Shakespeare was written in English and we speak English, so um, I won't be covering a worldwide uh, uh, Shakespearean uh, plays. So in uh, 1660, we come with the restoration of King Charles II, and uh, he uh, issued a royal warrant in 1662 declaring that all female roles should be played only by female actresses. So that was the beginning of female actresses on stage. They were looking back to classical Greece, and Shakespeare was revised to fit into the Aristotle unities of time, place, and action. And only the Tempest is, has that unity. So they revised some of Shakespeare's plays. And there was quite a bit about uh, extravagance, again, was starting to overpower the words. Now, this is from a 1913 film of Hamlet. But think of that page in the middle of the scene when I read you this quote. This is from a reviewer from a paper called The Spectator in this time period. The ordinary method of making a hero is to clap a huge plume of feathers on his head, which rises so very high that there is often a greater length from his chin to the top of his head than to the sole of his foot. As these superfluous ornaments make a great man, a princess gradually receives her, her grandeur from those additional encumbrances which fall into her tail. I mean the broad sweeping train which follows her in all her motions and forms constant employment for a boy who stands behind her to open and spread to advantage. I do not know how others are affected at this sight, but I must confess my eyes are wholly taken up with the page's part. And as for the queen, I am not so attentive to anything she speaks as to the right adjusting of her train. In short, I would have our conception raised by the dignity of thought and sublimity of express 
rather than by a train of robes or plume of feathers. So uh, some traditions become start in this time period. Uh, for instance, Hamlet's ghost is costumed in armor for the first time in this time period. And Hamlet's stocking for a number of years was actually done as ungartered, as several layers, because Shakespeare talks about uh, Hamlet being all ungartered. So everyone thought they had to actually do the ungartering. When we get to Georgian theater, uh, Georgian theater, a lot of it was melodramatic, and the emphasis was to the actor and their emotions rather than the playwright's poetry or accurate costumes to the time period of the character. So contemporary clothing was often provided by actors, and here you see David Garrick, a very famous actor and company manager. He established the first Shakespeare Festival in Stratford-upon-Avon. And here he is on the left in Macbeth, as Macbeth in a scarlet uniform of a contemporary British general. So we're talking the 1700s is the clothing. He's wearing his own contemporary clothing. On the right, he's costumed as Lear in 18th century coat trimmed in ermine to make it look like a king. And here's one of the first major actresses, Sarah Siddons. And her brother is on to the right of her, or to the right, to her left, our right. Uh, she is Macbeth, she is Lady Macbeth, he is playing Macbeth. They were a brother, sister, there was actually a whole family of Kembles who were um, plays, um, actors at the time. And she is in a garment from the 1700s. However, uh, there are bits and pieces about it that make me think she tried to make a little moment look Elizabethan. She was so famous in her day that commentators coined the word Sedonomania to describe her audiences, which wept and were hysterical, who were gripped with Siddons fever. And she was known for Lady Macbeth. Now here you see she has the stage garment to the left, and um, you see here's a garment from uh, LA County Museum, which is from that same time period. So you can kind of see the same silhouette. And up here, this is later, this is not a Shakespearean play, but this is from the 1790s. She's playing the character of Euphrasia, and it's very like the costume from the 1790s clothing. Another famous actress was Dorothea Jordan. She also happened to be the mistress of William IV, who was the English king before Victoria. Now, his, uh, William's wife had two children. Un unfortunately, they both died, and that's why Victoria became queen. Dorothea Jordan, whom he lived with for 20 years in a building separate from the palace, she gave him 10 children. I don't know when she had time to act, frankly. <laughs> she was a comic actress known for playing Breach's part, and here you see her as Viola from Twelfth Night on the left. And um, in looking at this, I would say that her vest is 1700s, her jacket looks to me like an attempt at an Elizabethan doublet, and her hat is Albanian or Greek. <laughs> and you'll see an Albanian or a Greek uh, man down below. On the right, you'll see Twelfth Night as well. On uh, Fabian, on the left, is, I would say, Cavalier, so he's early 1600s. Viola is a fanciful 1700s in kind of, you know, maybe Eastern European <laughs> fanciful. Sir Andrew is uh, contemporary. And Toby, on the right, is, I would say he's a mixture of Elizabethan and Cavalier. So it's kind of a mixture there. Now, along comes a scholar named J.R. Planchet. And in 1824, he talks to Charles Kemble, who is the younger brother of uh, Sarah and John. And he talks to um, Charles Kemble, who's putting on a production of King John. Now, this production was from 1865. So, but this gives you an idea of what it may have looked like. The production I'm going to talk to you about happened at Covent Garden in 1824. He felt that historical accuracy was really important. And here in the playbill, they tell you why. This present Monday will be revived Shakespeare's tragedy of King John with an attention to costume never equaled on the English stage. Every character will appear in the precise habit of the period, the whole of the dresses and decorations being executed from indisputable authorities, King John's effigy in Worcester Cathedral, Queen Eleanor's effigy in the Abbey of Fontevran, illuminated manuscripts, and he goes on to tell all these others. 
I feel that it, it probably capitalized on what was the growing interest in archaeological digs. But um, this was the beginning of very unified visual productions. Um, however, so this is 1865, so now we're 40 years later, but it gives you an idea of how it all looks of a piece. The Illustrated London News, however, of 1858 said, there is always danger in scenic illustration pictorially carried out and archeologically conducted that the spectacular will overlay through dramatic. So there we have the challenge again. This is the book that he, uh, J.R. Planchet also wrote uh, several books on costume. This is history of British costume with one of the plates. And he also wrote a book on heraldry. So he became very interested in costume history. Now, the now we go to the 19th century. There were many roles that were set and movement, intonation, and character were the same at every performance. The theatrical effect became often more important than the words. This, the peerless reader, was shown to me by my colleague Tara Holland. Tara, are you here? She, um, she was teaching this to one of her um, classes, and I happened to see this in the office, and I said, look, there's Majeska doing this, this pose. And this is, it's a book of recitations that you can do at home or have, you know, have guests in. And these are the poses that you can do <laughs> if you are revealing. And look, Majeska's doing that pose. I was so excited. And she's my lead-in to Helena Majeska. So Helena Majeska was born in Krakow, Poland in 1840. And she began her acting career in her early 20s. And she became very famous there. In fact, she was known as one of the most fashionable women of Warsaw by 1870. She moved to the United States in 1876 with the dream of having a California ranch. And she eventually did have one. She finally, she toured the United States and London, becoming widely popular. And she finally settled in Arden, which is the name of her farm. And uh, it's in Silverado, southeast of Irvine. It's about a 30-minute drive. And it's now part of the Orange County Park System. And then she died on Balboa Island in 1909. Uh, one of the reasons why I like Majeska is that she designed her own costumes. And she designed them so that not only did they fit her body well, but they fit her character's mood. And by the time, by the end of her career, she had over 65 trunks of costumes. She was also known for making innovations. This, uh, you'll see here Ophelia. On the left, she's in white in 1867. In 1871, she's in white, which was very traditional for Ophelia to be in white. In fact, I put her in white too. In 1889, she decided that she should be in green, which was very much like the, the uh, young, the, um, the earth, the green, and as you know, she goes, she drowns with flowers. So, um, so that was an innovation that was quite a surprise to her audience. Here on the right, you see Lady Macbeth and a painting of her. To gain publicity for her New York tour, she and her manager fabricated wild stories about herself. <laughs> she bought two alligators, named them Hansel and Gretel, and she put bows on them. She practiced target shooting during an interview with, with Joseph Pulitzer. That must have gone on well. And she claimed her jewels for Camille were from the Tsar of Russia. So she got a lot of publicity for that, and people came just to see that. Here's one of her favorite roles of Rosalind. And you see that she, is, she did research on the time period, but the silhouette on the right is 1880s. With, but she's added some Elizabethan sleeves, an Elizabethan neck ruff, but she is trying to appeal to her modern audience, which is very fashion conscious. People came to see her fashions. And I'll, here you see on the left, this is Juliet now, 1871 on the left, and down to the right of it is a garment from 1870s. That's a bustle dress. So you can see the silhouette there. 1882, she's Juliet again, and to the bottom right, you see the silhouette of the 1880s. Up above it, 
you'll see a picture of Majeska jackets that were on the market. So people were very interested in coming to see her plays. Uh, so her, she took her historical research and used it to her advantage. Uh, and I'll show you a few other famous actresses of the time. Many of you may have heard of Sarah Bernhardt. She was a French actress. She also became famous in England and the United States. Her personal luggage consisted of 45 costume crates for her 15 different productions and 75 crates for her offstage clothing, including <laughs> her 250 pair of shoes. <laughs> She also was a bit eccentric, and for Cleopatra, she kept two garter snakes who became the asp. <laughs> she also, as you see, played Hamlet. And Mucha, who is a wonderful artist of the time, did several posters for her. And I love this quote. It gives you a bit of an idea of her sass. <laughs> Oscar Wilde, do you mind if I smoke? Sarah Bernheit, I don't care if you burn. <laughs> I think I might use that sometime. <laughs> Ellen Terry is another actress, and she, of the time, she acted with the famous uh, uh, tragedian Henry Irving, who had his own company. And George Bernard Shaw thought she was an intellectual as well as an instinctual actress. She happened to be the mother of Edward Gordon Craig, who is a very famous scene designer, and she's the aunt to Sir John Gilgood, which I did not know. So um, here she is on the left in a painting by John Singer Sargent. That is her costume in the middle. And this is a photograph of her, not in that costume, but you get the idea of the braids and the crown. And this is a close-up of that costume. Those are beetle wings. Don't feel sorry for the beetles, they shed them. But I think it's fabulous. This gown, which is, was uh, displayed in Kent, was restored for 50,000 pounds, and it took 1,300 hours to restore that. Now, Shaw, oh, let me show you another. Um, I think it was the inspiration for Queen Eleanor in Brave, don't you think? Yeah? Now, Shaw thought that he wanted to lure her away from Irving to act in modern drama, uh, such as his plays and those of Ibsen. So now we come into the world of modern drama and realism, where art must depict the truthful world. It's, this is the beginning of modern theater, where characters are fully fleshed out, they're not a type, the motor, internal motivations are revealed, and there's not as much posturing. In 1895, William Pohl, who was a Elizabethan scholar, founded the Elizabethan Stage Society, which propounded simplicity, using an open stage, a unified acting ensemble, an uncut text, very little scenery, and a swift pace of performance. Now, at the time, that same time, we have two scene designers, Adolf Appiah and Edward Gordon Craig. On the left, Adolf Appiah, he felt that, that scenery should be three-dimensional, not painted. And he felt that light should be a response to emotion, and there should be one vision on the whole stage. He wrote a book called The Staging of Wagner's Musical Dramas in 1895, and he was well known for working on Wagner's. Uh, opera. Edward Gordon Craig, who as I said was the son of Ellen Terry, he wrote a book called The Art of Theatre in 1905 and here he has, this is his production of Hamlet in 1912 at the Moscow Art Theatre. He felt that there should be a single setting and all elements should combine to form the whole. It should have a sense of grandeur and be bold and dramatic and that theatre was an art. Now, today's productions give, have the same dilemma, how to be accurate to Shakespeare, yet appeal to a modern audience. Previously, actors often provided their own costumes. Now, it's much more of a unified vision, with the director and the designer collaborating. It's not just character delineation, but costume design also provides or supports the mood and supports the theme. Sometimes costumes are more suggestive than representative, and I'll show you some of the permutations. I would say that the, it's an eclectic mix. You will have people designing Shakespeare as Elizabethan or historic to the time period of that character. 
imaginative and experimental, and modern dress. And some of this is, has to do with budgetary constraints. If you don't have the money to do a full-out Elizabethan production, then maybe you'll find another route to do it. So some of the designers today are fashion designers. Uh, here is Macbeth, done by Terry Mugler. I have to say, I, I love the witch. <laughs> but Lady Macbeth on the left, not so sure. <laughs> Artists have been hired to do interpretations. Here's Romeo and Juliet in 1921 by Alexandra Exter. And this is Macbeth on the right, that's Banquo's Ghost in 1954, Mario Prasinos. You have artists who have been painting uh, the Shakespeare characters. And on the left, I, I think, is probably the most famous painting of Ophelia by John Everett Millay. Um, but the pre-Raphaelites were very much into Ophelia and her drowning. But we also have professional costume designers. Yay, that's what I am. <laughs> and here are, here's a cavalcade of some of the characters that you will see out in the exhibit. So here we have Ophelia on the left, played by Jean Simmons in the film in 1948, uh, and a medieval look. On the right, you have Kate Winslet in 1996, and she is being costumed in the 1800s. Rosalind, Ellen Mirren on the left in 1978 in medieval costume. Bryce Dallas Howard in 2006 in a production that was set in Japan in the early part of the 20th century. So she's actually wearing a kimono in the very, in the bottom picture. But her hair is a Gibson girl hairdo. Here's Juliet, Olivia Hussey in 1968 and uh, uh, you will see that it's a uh, very traditional um, Italian Renaissance. On the right is Claire Danes in 1996, and I and showed a picture uh, of the guys on the right because you can see it was a modern dress production. Now we're into Lady Macbeth. This is Vivian Lee on the left, 1955, medieval. Marion Cotillard. Uh, a very recent film on Macbeth. And I would say that that's a mashup between medieval and high fashion. Is, <laughs> that's how I would kind of look at it. That, that dress was on exhibit at FITM downtown. Uh, every year they have an exhibit of costumes from films. And Jacqueline Duran was just nominated for two Academy Awards this last go, so she's quite a well-known designer. Uh, now, there are three productions that I'd like to show you uh, for the final part of this talk. The first one is Orson Welles. He designed, or he directed, I should say, a production of Macbeth, which was nicknamed Voodoo Macbeth, <laughs> 1936. And here's the thing that was, I think, very fascinating about it. It was a works project administration, a WPA production. It was created under Federal Project One to put artists to work creating murals, music festivals, and theater presentations. Harry Hopkins, who was the advisor to FDR, said when, when there was pushback about why should we do this, why should we give artists money, he said, hell, they've got to eat just like other people. <laughs> I like him. So they hired Hanny, Hallie Flanagan, who was a professor at Vassar, who was also a playwright and producer. And she was named head of the theater branch. But the thing that's, I think, wonderful about Hallie is she wanted to use the funds not just to produce theater and to produce Shakespeare, but also to promote diversity and combat racism of the time. Orson Welles, who was just 20, was hired, and he set Macbeth in Haiti, which was based on the life of Henri Christophe, who was the king of northern Haiti from 1811 to 1820. It, as you can imagine, garnered a lot of bit of a lot of criticism. Not only that there were African Americans on stage, but that it, it was a well, kind of a the costumes. I think were a little wild. You can imagine people being a little concerned about this, uh, and, and it's just on the left. However, it was an audience hit, 
and it had a 15-minute standing ovation. And the thing that I think is also most extraordinary, it was an integrated theater. And at that time, that was very unusual. And not even Porgy and Bess at the time was an integrated theater. Um, so it was, it, after it ran in New York, it played across the country to sold out crowds. And then, as many of you may know, Wells went on to direct Citizen Kane, which is AFI's number one movie of all time. On the right is a picture from his 1948 film, Macbeth. And here's another production which has been, become very famous. It's Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream. On the left, you see costumes in 1954 designed by, uh, it's a trio of costume designers named Motley. And that, I would say, is a more traditional view of the fairies. On the right is uh, the Peter Brook and Sally Jacobs uh, idea of what it should look like. He wanted to strip away all the conventions, and he put it in a white box. He had, he had a young company and had them do quite a bit of acrobatics. There was a lot of joy and energy, and he wanted the audience's imagination to evoke the settings of the forest and the court. But it became a, a landmark production. And now I'm going to go back and finish with the last production, 1954, or sorry, 55. This is a production of King Lear. It was designed by Isamu Noguchi, uh, the uh, Japanese-American sculptor. And it was directed by uh, Sir John Gilgood. Their program note said, our object in this production has been to find a setting and costumes which would be free of historical or decorative associations so that the timeless, universal, and mythical quality of the story may be clear. We have tried to present the places and the characters in a very simple and basic manner for the play to come to life through the words and acting. However, the reviews were scathing. <laughs> the women are hideously wrapped, while the men wear dark deck tennis rings for hats and variations on the cellular bath mat over spacesuits in heavy leather. <laughs> The noblemen resemble mainly baseball players, waffle irons, or the crew of a spaceship. Surely the king is driven to madness, not the audience. <laughs> However, there were two reviews that were a little kinder. Richard Buckle from The Observer said, it was a bold and altogether commendable gesture to commission the American Japanese sculpture. sculptor. Excuse me. The London theater is the home of lost cliches and impossible loyalties and I welcome any experiment. His inscrutable objects have a stone-like grandeur, Stonehenge-like grandeur, which seems to fit them for a background to Shakespeare's wildest play. And Henry Hobson, a very famous reviewer from the Sunday Times said, the sum of it all is that at the Palace Theater, Mr. Noguchi is providing an entertainment which in its originality and unexpectedness has no parallel in Britain. I enjoyed it, but insular at heart. I do not wish to praise Mr. Noguchi too highly. Nothing palls so quickly as spectacle. It is tremendously exciting for half an hour or so, and then its appeal collapses. These players are too good to be used as scenery's adjunct. Sir John is a very great actor. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, we are always trying to find the balance between the words and the spectacle. And this summer, I will give a little plug. This summer at the New Swan, I am sure that they will also be doing that for The Winter's Tale and Midsummer Night's Dream. And I know Eli has postcards. And uh, my feeling is that the art may change, but the why remains the same. How best to illuminate the great bard's words. Thank you. I forgot questions and answers. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Is uh, the effect on the military uh, designs uh, for what they were wearing? Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that they got those from various conquests at the time that were being referred by uh, Shakespeare himself? And, or, or is it uh, that soldiers bought their own uh, weaponry? So maybe it's passed down from family generation? Uh, well, even today, I'd say, so, uh, I'd say, through all costuming, some of it is real and some of it is costume. 
Uh, I wouldn't be surprised in Shakespeare's day if there were some things that were, like the scimitar may have been something that they purchased uh, that was available. I mean, if he was um, referencing that at, at the time that he was portraying, is it possible that those people were getting their weapons? And so his, his, his depiction was actually realistic. Is that possible? You mean the Elizabethan weapons? Yes, it could. They could have been real. Um, I don't know that he actually had real Roman armor, but um, you know, I I have used real costumes from um, the early part of the 20th century. The only challenge with that is that uh, you have to be careful that fabrics don't start to rip on the actors' bodies. Um, armor. Um, at, there's a costume house called Western Costume that has some armor. I think some of it may be real, but I think a lot of it is fabricated. So I would say, I don't know specifically, but I would say all through history there's probably a combo platter of that. If you could get the real deal, then you'd buy the real deal. Especially if no one thought it was worth anything. We often don't think things are worth anything until a hundred years later, and then we go, ah, wait! Yeah. Okay, yes? Hello? Yeah. Hi. Um, when you are designing a specific costume, do you have a process to get inspiration? Well, uh, I would say that I first read the script, talk to the director, mm -hmm. see if they have a specific vision that they want, and then I will do research. Uh, if it's in a certain time period, I will do research of that specific time period. Uh, but I would say that inspiration can come in from the wildest places. I remember for Taming of the Shrew, which I have a sketch out there of Taming of the Shrew, I got that color scheme from, I was living in New York at the time, and I was walking through the subway and there was this really fabulous graffiti on the wall. And I got my color scheme from the graffiti on the wall. Because it just hit me and went, those colors would be great. But um, I would say research, I, I do quite a bit of research. For almost every show I have a notebook. I print my research out and my notebook is about this thick. And sometimes I have several notebooks. It just depends on how detailed I have to be and how specific to a time period I have to be. Does that yes. help to answer that? Thank you. Someone else? I don't know much about art, but um, I remember when I was very, very young that one of the first movies that I saw that impacted me because of the country design was Amadeus. Oh, yes. Um, how important is accuracy of the time design, custom design versus potentially, you know, the, 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 the flow of the play or the movie? Um, I don't know if you understand what I'm asking that, you know accuracy of the time design versus what is good for the movie flow or the theater flow and how does that affect? I, I think you have to have a balance. You can't have uh, a garment on someone that at that time, in the let's say the 1700s, would have been perfectly acceptable, but today we would think is stupid. Um, for instance, men's pants in the 1700s were tight in the front. But in order for them to sit down, they needed more room in the back. So they kind of look like they have dighty butts. <laughs> well, you can't quite put that on an actor today and have them feel like they're masculine. <laughs> so you have to find a way to get around that. Um, it, it really depends on the director's vision. And I would say that film is more realistic than theater uh, as a whole. This is a generality. And uh, in um, when you have a costume, for instance, uh, Anna Karenina, a recent film that was done, Jacqueline Duran, who in fact designed Lane Macbeth, uh, she designed it in the late 1800s. However, there is a scene where they are all dancing. Uh, there's a kind of a ball scene. They, they did this, they set it in a theater. This, the whole story happened in a theater. And as they're dancing, I noticed that the costumes didn't quite look 1800s. There was a 1950s flair to them. And, um, and she won the Academy Award, so somebody liked it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I also will say that 
I was watching a production called Rain, R-E-I-G-N. It was on uh, Warner Brothers. And I just happened past and I went, oh look, it's Mary Queen of Scots. And then I went, what, what's happening with these costumes? <laughs> And there's this scene where the Queen of France, and I'm thinking, she doesn't look like she's wearing a corset. What's going on here? And she comes out of the room, and she turns, she's in her bedroom, and she turns her back to the audience. She pulls this open, so there must have been Velcro. She pulls open the back of her gown and takes it off, and underneath is a contemporary negligee. And I scream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't believe this. What is going on? So they were trying to appeal to a modern audience that didn't know the difference. And it was more, I, I think that production was more Gossip Girls meets Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, again, it depends on the vision. It wasn't the vision that I was supporting because I was shocked by how badly referenced it was. But, you know, people watched it for a long time. The script was really bad, too. <laughs> Don't go out into the forest. Bad things happen there. It was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Yes, and we have a question down here. Do you know the costumes of Lady Majestic can be seen anywhere nearby? Are they in museums? Um, I know that uh, the, the museum, the Bowers, has a few pieces. Uh, there are some in Poland. Um, I think Majeska House has bits, but not a full costume. The problem with uh, her costumes or her clothing is that um, at the end of her life, she cut up pieces of her costumes to give to friends and fans. And a lot of it was after she died, her husband sent it back to Poland, and a lot of it was destroyed during World War II. So uh, the pieces that you will see in this catalog are some of the pieces that still exist. And I was impressed that Danielle got pictures of the ones from Poland. So. Actually, we have time for one more question. <coughs> now, you've worked in a variety of things over the course of your career. And I wonder if you have a favorite period to work in or if you find them all equally interesting and challenging. Well, I think, I think I should say that I find them all equally challenging. Um, and, and different productions mean different things to me. Uh, Phantom of the Opera was the first production I was uh, associate designer on it. And it was because I had worked on that and saw the depth and the, and the money we were able to spend on that. It enabled me to go on and design musicals afterwards and really have an understanding of how it all happens. Uh, time period wise, perhaps my favorite is turn of the century, 1900 to 196, because I just think it's so gracious. Would I want to wear those clothes? No. But I'm happy to put actresses in them. <laughs> and that might be my favorite time period, yeah. Okay, thank you all.